Amen. All right, well, we're there in Psalm chapter number 19. And of course, last week, on, uh, we started a new series on Sunday nights called Declaring Doctrine. And what we're going to do is we're going to spend many weeks on Sunday nights <clears throat> doing a systematic study of the major doctrines of the Word of God. And um, honestly, this is the type of thing that people go to Bible college for. They take Bible doctrines uh, classes in Bible college and things like that. Uh, it's going to be very much learning, and we want you to be grounded in the truth. We want you to be grounded in, in what the Bible teaches, and I want to encourage all of you to be taking notes. If you don't have a baby sitting on your lap, you know, take notes through all these sermons, and that way you can have them and reference back to them. And uh, if you remember last week, we began with an introductory sermon on just the importance of doctrine and why we would want to even learn about doctrine. Tonight, we're going to jump in uh, into the first major doctrine we're going to learn about, and I want to start kind of at the beginning where we would begin as mankind with God. And tonight I'm preaching on the subject of the doctrine of revelation. Now, when we talk about the doctrine of revelation, I don't want you to be confused. We're not talking about the book of Revelation, all right? We're not talking about uh, prophecy or end times. That's actually a doctrine as well, and we'll cover that in this series, the doctrine of end times. But when we're talking about the doctrine of revelation, what we're talking about is how God reveals himself to mankind, how God reveals himself to mankind, and how we even know that there is a God. Now, when we talk about the doctrine of revelation, I want you to understand that there are two major uh, parts to this idea or, there's doc or this doctrine. There's what's known as general revelation, and then there's what's known as specific revelation. Uh, revelation. Tonight, we're going to focus on general revelation, but, uh, and then next week, we'll talk about specific generation, uh, uh, revelation. And I'll tell you right now that the specific revelation, of course, is referring to the Word of God. And Psalm 19 is interesting because when you look at the first six verses, and we're going to go walk through them here in a minute, you'll notice that the emphasis is on general revelation, how God generally reveals himself uh, to mankind. And then starting in verse 7, he shifts the focus to specific revelation. Verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And of course, this is all referring to the word of God. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honey comb. So today, tonight, we're going to learn and we're going to study this idea of general revelation. And what that means is this. How is it that God in general or generally reveals himself to mankind? All right, so I've got two major points and we've got some sub points uh, for those of you that want to take notes and I'd encourage you to do that. Point number one is this. God reveals himself through creation. The God generally uh, in general, reveals himself to mankind through creation. Now, he specifically reveals himself through the Word of God, and we'll talk about that next week. But in general, in general, it, without taking into account the Bible and the Word of God, God reveals himself through creation. And God reveals himself specifically through the creation of the universe. And this is what the Bible teaches uh, and this is what your heart and my heart would tell us to be true. And it is this, that creation declares a creator. Creation itself declares the fact that there is a creator. Are you there in Psalm 19? Look at verse 1. Of course, there's the, the, the little phrase there, might be in your Bible, to the chief musician, a Psalm of David. Then the Psalm begins like this, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament. The word firmament is a reference, is another, it's a uh, synonym for the word heaven, and it's in reference to the sky. The firmament is where the birds fly, where the clouds are. He says, the firmament showeth his handiwork. So he says, look, the heavens, they declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth the handiwork of God. Notice verse 2, though, day unto day uttereth speech. He says, look, every day. Day unto day, day after day, week after week, month after month, the heavens and the firmament declare the glory and the handiwork of God, and it's like they're preaching a sermon to us. 
It's like they're communicating something to us about God. He says, day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is, notice what he says, there is no speech, nor, uh, nor language, where their voice is not heard. Where whose voice is not heard? The voice of creation. He says, look, you, uh, there is not one place on this earth. You know, we are going to eventually in this series talk about uh, the doctrine of evangelism and the work that God has given us, the ministry of reconciliation. And our goal is to go unto the uttermost parts of the earth and to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you know that creation, the message of creation, there's not one place on this earth. There's not any language. There's no speech. There's no group of people that have not heard the message from creation that cannot look up to heaven and see that the glory of God is declared through the creation of the universe. He says there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out, notice, through all the earth. Creation has declared God through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. And here's what he's saying. He's saying throughout all the earth and throughout all of time, creation has been a witness and has preached a sermon. It has uttered speech to every man, every language, every tribe, every society on earth. The universe preaches a sermon to all mankind, which all mankind hears, and no one is left out. So when we are learning about this doctrine of revelation, how God reveals himself to mankind, we start, of course, with this idea that God reveals himself through creation, and creation uh, declares a creator. He reveals himself through the creation of the universe, and the creation declares a creator. You're there in Psalm 19. Look at Psalm 50. If you flip a few pages over, you'll find that this is a consistent uh, thought throughout the Bible. Psalm 50. And I would say this. This is the reason. This is the reason that every society, every group of people, tribes, villages, throughout history, since the creation of mankind, every people group, no matter how remote, no matter how far, no matter how isolated, everyone has always believed that there is a God. Now, they don't necessarily believe in the Jehovah God or understand Jehovah, understand the Lord, understand the Lord Jesus Christ. That comes through specific revelation of the Word of God. But in general, in general, God and the existence of God has been revealed through the creation of the universe, and everyone is born and is able to look up, and that's why throughout all history, men and women have always believed that there is a God, that there is a higher being, that there is someone that created them. And in fact, the only people who believed that there is no God had to go to an institution to be taught that. They had to be brainwashed and they had to have that belief dismantled from them because just naturally speaking, as humans are born and grow up and look up at the sky and look at the sunset and look at the stars and look at nature, nature declares the glory and the handiwork of God. Psalm 50, look at verse 6. Psalm 50 and verse 6, the Bible says this, And the heavens shall declare His righteousness. For God is the judge himself, Selah. Notice Psalm 97 in verse 6. If you flip a few psalms over, Psalm 97. And do me a favor, put a ribbon or a bookmark or your bulletin or something there in Psalms because we're going to leave it and we're going to come back to it. Psalm 97 in verse 6. Notice what the Bible says. The heavens declare his righteousness and all the people see his glory. See whose glory? They see God's glory. So throughout the Bible, the Bible teaches this idea that the heavens declare the righteousness of God, that the heavens declare the existence of God, that the firmament showeth His handy work. Now keep your place there in the psalm. We're going to come back to it. Go with me to the book of Romans, Romans chapter number 1. Romans chapter number 1. And here's what you need to understand. When we're talking about the doctrine of revelation, and right now we're talking about general revelation, or generic revelation, whatever you want to call it, just 
how does God reveal himself to mankind, generally speaking? We must understand that God does it through creation. And he does it through the creation of the universe because the Bible tells us, we just saw several verses in Psalms, that creation declares a creator. But there's more than that. Not only does creation declare a, uh, uh, declare a creator, but creation reveals judgment. Are you there in Romans 1? Look at verse 18. Romans chapter 1 and verse 18. Notice what the Bible says. For the wrath of God, for the wrath of God is revealed. Notice that word revealed. What does it mean? It means it's made known. It's disclosed. It's, it's made to be able to see. For the wrath of God is revealed. How is the wrath of God revealed? Notice, from heaven, by nature, through nature. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. We'll come back to that verse later on. Notice verse 20. For the invisible things of Him, the invisible things of who? Of God. The invisible things of Him from the creation of the world, notice, are clearly seen. The Bible teaches that God, though God is invisible, His existence is clearly seen. You say, how? From the creation of the world, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Notice that the Bible says the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. And the Bible teaches this concept that it is nature, that God reveals Himself in nature, in creation, God reveals himself to mankind. But I want you to understand something. There is no good news in that message. That message goes to the ends of the world. That message is, uh, is translated into every language, into every speech, into every village, into every uh, tribe, into every society. All mankind can look at creation and understand that there is a creator. But the message of creation only reveals the wrath of God. Do you understand that? Notice verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed. I mean, have you ever wondered why mankind without the Bible basically believes the same thing? We're talking about, man, we're talking about what you and I would consider heathen pagans through history for thousands of years, whether they were Greek, whether they were Romans, whether they were Aztecs in South America, all throughout the universe, if you have, or throughout the world, if you have mankind without the word of God, you know what you have? You have pagans who believe in a God who's wrathful, who's angry. That's why they sacrifice, right? That's why every pagan religion has, sac has had human sacrifices and animal sacrifices and this sacrifice and that sacrifice. Why? Why? What, where did they come to that? Well, they came to that because you can look up at heaven and realize that we didn't put ourselves here. Someone put us here. Someone created us. Someone with uh, intellect and intelligence, with wisdom and knowledge put us here. And if we were put here by someone, then we are accountable to someone. And the doctrine of general revelation teaches that God reveals himself through creation. And creation not only declares a creator, but it reveals judgment. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven. And here's what I want you to understand. The message that comes from creation is not enough to get anybody saved. No one's going to look up to the sun, look up to the moon, look up to the stars, and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That will require specific revelation from the Word of God and someone with the Holy Spirit communicating that. But creation is enough to put in the heart of man that we are accountable to someone and that there is a God whose wrath is revealed from heaven. The reason that an unregenerate man can look up to heaven and understand a creator whom they are accountable to is because of the complexity of the universe. The Bible says that God created the world in wisdom and in knowledge. Go back to Psalm. Uh, keep your place there in Romans. We're going to come back to it if you would. Uh, go back to Psalm 136. Keep your place in Romans. Psalm 136. Psalm 136. Look, the only way you could be smart enough 
to look at creation and think that this just came about, that nothing created everything, and that perfect order came from chaos. The only way that someone would be that smart is to spend four years in an institution where they're being brainwashed. <laughs> because no one would look at our stars and the moon. No one would look at, 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 no one would look at the animals and how they interact. Nobody would look at uh, the way that our, 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 our uh, world is developed and the seasons. Nobody would look at that and say, oh, this was a mistake. Anyone would look at that and realize someone designed this. Someone created this. Somebody planned this out. Psalm 136 and verse 5, the Bible says this, To him that by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endureth forever. Psalm 104 and verse 24, if you would, just head back there to Psalm 104 and verse 24. The Bible says this, Psalm 104, verse 24, O Lord, how manifold are thy works. In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. Job 37, if you would, just you're there in Psalms, just flip one book back. Job 37. Job 37 in verse 17. Now I ask you to keep your place in Romans, and I ask you to keep your place in Psalms. You can go ahead and lose your place in Psalms, but keep it in Job, because we're going to leave it and we're going to come back to Job, all right? So keep your place in Romans and keep your place in Job. Job 37, verse 14, the Bible says this, Hearken unto this, O Job, stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. Dost thou know when God disposed them and caused the light of his cloud to shine? Dost thou know when the balancing of the cloud, know the balancing of the clouds, the wondrous works of him which is perfect, notice, in knowledge. The Bible is clear that the earth was created by a God who is full of knowledge, who is full of wisdom, who is full of power. Go to Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10. You're there in Job. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Son of, uh, uh, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah. And we're going to come back to Job, so make sure you keep your finger there. But you've got Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah 10, 12, the Bible says this, He hath made the earth by His power. He hath established the world by His wisdom and hath stretched out the heavens by His discretion. And again, nobody, nobody could look up at nature could look at nature, whether you want to look at it in the sea, in the sky, whether you want to look at it uh, in the land, nobody would look at that and say, this perfect balance came from chaos, this perfect design came from nowhere. The Bible is clear that God, generally speaking, and in general, reveals himself to mankind through creation. And he does it, first of all, through the creation of the universe. And the creation of the universe, what does that do? It declares a creator and it reveals judgment. It reveals the wrath of God. It won't get anybody saved, but it'll get them condemned. It'll get them fearful enough and scared enough to try to search out some God and maybe make some sort of sacrifice or appeasement of that God. And it basically just sets them up for a missionary to be able to come and preach to them the revealed gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to notice not only does God reveal himself through the creation of the universe, but there's another way that God reveals himself through creation. He does it through the creation of the universe, and then he also does it through the creation of life. See, God is the source of life. And God reveals himself physically through un the universe, the stars, the heavens, the moon, the sky. But he also reveals himself through the creation of life. Are you there in Job? Look at Job 12. Job chapter 12 and verse 7. Notice what, Job, what the book of Job says. Job 12 and verse 7, it says this, But ask now the beast, Job would say. Ask the animals. But ask now the beast, and they shall teach thee. And the fowls of the air, and they shall tell thee. They said, just look at the animals. 
Just, just look at the amazing wildlife that is on this earth. He says, and if you pay attention, they will teach thee. And if you listen, they will tell thee, verse 8, or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee. And the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee, who knoweth not in all these. He said, notice what he says. He says, who knoweth not? He says, who can look? This is what Job would say. He said, who can look at the fish and at the fowls and at the beasts and at the earth? He says, and who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this? He says, he says you can't honestly look at life, animal life, and not know that the Lord did not do this. The word wrought means to work this, that he wrought this. He says, who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this? Go to Psalm 104. Keep your place there in Job. We're going to come back to it. But if you're there in Job, uh, just go back one book over to Psalms. Psalm 104. Psalm 104 and verse 24. Notice what the Bible says. Psalm 104, verse 24, the Bible says this, O Lord, how manifold are thy works. We already read this, but I want you to see it again. In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. Look at verse 25. So is the great and wide sea, wherein are things creeping innumerable, both small and great beasts. Notice the Bible tells us, the Bible says, hey, do you want to know God? You want to see God revealed? Do you want God to reveal himself? He said, just look at the sky. Look at the earth. Look at creation. It, it declares. The heavens declare. The firmament uh, uh, declares the glory and the handiwork of God. And then the Bible would say, you still want to see God? Just look at life. He said, he said, look at the great and wide sea, wherein things creeping innumerable, both small and great beasts. He says, look at the animals. You know what they'll tell you? There's a God. That God reveals himself. God reveals himself through the creation of the universe. The creation declares a creator and the, and the creation declares judgment. God reveals himself through the creation of life. He declares himself through animal life, but he also declares himself through human life. Notice Psalm 139. Psalm 139. And it's important that we make that distinction because human life and animal life are not the same. I know we live in a society today that has rejected God and that wants to tell us that we came from animals and that we're equal to animals, but the Bible does not teach that. The Bible says that you and I were created in the image of God. The Bible says that we were created different and greater and better than the animals. Now, God says you can look at the animals, you can look at the animals and realize that this was not a mistake. This was not some sort of a weird accident. This was not a process of, of evolution. He says, look, if you just look at the animals and look at how they're built and, and how they uh, perform, it's obvious that there's a creator behind it. Amen. But then God says this, you can look at yourself. You can look at human life, Psalm 139, verse 13. Psalm 139 and verse 13, the Bible says this, For thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee. I love these words. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. And by the way, he's talking about a human in the womb, and I'm, I'm, I just, you know this already, but there is value in the life, in, in life in a womb. Those babies that are being aborted today by the tune of 3,000 a day, God would say of those children that they are fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. Notice verse 15, he says, My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lower parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And he says, though I was not complete, he says, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. He says, how precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. And he says, look, he says, when I was in the womb, he said, before that I even had members, before I even had the body parts, 
I was already precious in God's sight, and he had thoughts about me. Thy thoughts unto me, O God, how great is the sum of them. So you say, well, how does God reveal himself? Well, look, you should be able to look at your own body and realize you were fearfully and wonderfully made. You were created by a creator. And if you were created by a creator, that means that that creator has a purpose, and that means that that creator has a plan, and that means that that creator will hold you accountable. So we begin this series of lessons on the doctrine, and we kind of have to start where all mankind starts, and it's with this, the doctrine of revelation, how God generally reveals himself to mankind. And God does it through creation. He reveals himself through the creation of the universe because the universe, the world itself, the sea, the moon, the, moon, the stars, the planets, they declare a creator and they reveal judgment. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven, the Bible says. And not only does creation reveal God through the creation of the universe, but creation reveals God through the creation of life, both animal and human life. I'm trying to do the best I can to give you these points. If you're writing them down, they will be on the midterm, so you might want to take notes. <laughs> Go back to Romans chapter 1. This is like the best Bible college class ever. <laughs> Romans chapter 1, because it's free, you know. Romans chapter 1. And you're actually learning something. Bible college, you're just learning how to be lame. Romans 1. Here's point number 2. When we're talking about general revelation, how God reveals himself to mankind in general, I want you to notice, first of all, God does it through creation. But there's a second way God does it. It's a two-pronged approach. One is that God does it outside of us through creation. In other ways, that God does it inside of us through conscience. God reveals himself outwardly through creation, and God reveals himself inwardly through conscience. Are you there in Romans 1? Look at verse 19. Notice what the Bible says. Because that, notice, because that which may be known. Notice he says, this can be known. This is knowledge that you can have. Because that which may be known of God is manifest, is readily perceived, is evident, it's apparent. That's what that means. He says, because that which may be known of God is manifest, notice, in them. He says, God reveals himself outside of them through creation, but then God also reveals himself inside of them. You say, how? Through conscience. For God hath showed it unto them. The word showed means to be seen, to become visible. That which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. You say, how does God do that? Well, notice, Paul is kind of taking the church at Rome through a little bit of a systematic theology uh, series himself, because in Romans 2, he continues this idea. Go to Romans 2, look at verse 14. Romans chapter 2 and verse 14. Romans chapter 2 and verse 14, the Bible says this, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, right? They don't have the specific revelation of God. They don't have the oracles of God. They don't have the word of God. This is Paul speaking to the Romans 2,000 years ago. The Gentiles is a reference to the heathens, the pagans. He says, look, for when the Gentiles, which have not the law, they didn't have the law of Moses, they didn't have the book of Moses, they didn't have the commandments of Moses. He says, for when the Gentiles, which have not the law, notice what he says, do by nature the things contained in the law. And Paul would say to these, the, these Roman believers, he would say, have you ever thought about this? How heathens who do not have the law of God by nature just kind of do the things? that are contained in the law. He says, For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these, notice, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. And here's the truth. Here's the truth. Throughout history, throughout time, throughout this world, in every village, tribe, society, nation, groups of people, generally speaking, men and women have agreed that there is a God. And that the wrath of God is revealed and we must appease that God. 
But you know that generally speaking, most people have just agreed with certain basic truths like murder is wrong, stealing is wrong, adultery is wrong. Now, we understand that there are some reprobate cultures out there that, you know, are going to be eating people and the cannibals and all that stuff. We understand that there are those. But in general, do you understand that in general, throughout human history, no matter what society, whether it's the Far East, whether it's the West, throughout human history, men in general have all kind of agreed that murder is probably not a good thing, that stealing is not a good thing, that lying is a bad thing. Where does that come from? Where does that come from? Because here's the truth. If there is no God and evolution is true, there's nothing wrong with murder. I mean, you're, you're just a mistake. You're, you're just a body. You don't have a body. You are a body because if there is no God and evolution is true, you have no soul. You aren't anything. You don't actually love. You've just got these cells and these wires and these hormones inside of you that make you think you love your wife or you love your husband and you love your children, but it's really just survival of the fittest and something that evolved to kind of get us to group together and protect each other and keep the species alive. It's a really weird way of looking at life. If evolution is true, killing, there's nothing wrong with killing. By the way, that's why these kids that walk into these schools and shoot up all their friends, a lot of them are evolutionists and Nazis and all these things. Why? Because that's where that thinking leads. But see, that by nature, though, most people, by nature, most people, whether they're Christian, non-Christian, whether they've ever heard, thou shalt not kill, whether they've ever heard the message of the Bible, most people, by nature, are a law unto themselves. Notice verse 15 which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness. And their thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. You ever had this internal dialogue? Should I do it? Should I not? Should I do it? Should I not? I really want to steal that pen from church. You're going to have the pen, okay? The ushers keep watching me. This internal dialogue, where does that come from? I'll tell you where it comes from, from God. God put something inside of every human being, and it's called a conscience. Everyone is born with one. Everybody has a conscience. Everybody is born with a conscience. You say, well, why? Why did God do that? Here's why God did that. Because God reveals himself outwardly through creation, and God reveals himself inwardly through our conscience. And there's this two-pronged approach that when a Holy Spirit-filled witness of the Lord Jesus Christ shows up on on a shore in Africa or in the Philippines or in a real heathen place, California, they can go to unbelievers and say, you're accountable to a God. You're accountable to the God of the Bible. And there is something inside of them that says, I know. Because God generally, God generally reveals himself through creation, and God generally reveals himself through conscience. Everyone is born with a conscience. Now, your conscience can be seared. That's a sermon for another day. That's a different doctrine called the doctrine of being a reprobate, Uh, and we'll deal with that, I'm sure, in this series. But your conscience can be seared. Your conscience can be hurt. Your conscience can be ignored. But you're born with a conscience. And even unsaved people have a conscience. Go to John chapter 8, if you would. John chapter 8. You've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, John chapter 8, and look at verse number 3. John chapter number 8 and verse number 3. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John chapter 8 and verse 3. The Bible says this, And the scribes and Pharisees, these are religious people, but they're not saved. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him, this is Jesus, a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, you know the story, it's a one-on story. This woman was taken in adultery. In the very act, I always think that's interesting. In the very act. And it's like, okay, well, if it was in the very act, where's the guy? Verse 5. 
Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? And I'm not preaching on this story, of course. There's a lot here, and I've preached about it before, and I'm not going to get into those details. I just want you to notice something. Verse 6, this they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. And really the idea is that there's no right answer to this question. There's no right answer. Whatever Jesus says, if he says, yeah, you're right, the law of Moses says to stone her, so stone her, then they'll just accuse him to the Romans and say, he's telling us to follow the law of a different God or a different government. And if he says, well, the Roman law says don't stone her, so don't stone her, then they'll go to all the people and say, he's telling us not to follow the law of Moses. So there's really no right answer to this question. It's just kind of a catch-22. And by the way, I'm not preaching on this, but let me just say this. Do you know that you don't have to answer every question? There's some questions you don't need to answer. There's some details you don't need to give. And here Jesus is being tempted that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Now, nobody knows what Jesus wrote. And people like to argue and debate what he might have wrote. Who, we don't know what he was writing. He could have been writing his grocery list, for all we know. I think he probably, you know, if I had to take a guess, and this is totally a guess, just my opinion, I, I think he probably started writing, you know, writing their names. Zacchaeus, stealing. Bob, you know, cheated in third grade or whatever, you know, and he started writing all their sins out, maybe. I don't know. We don't know that. I've just, I just, I, I think that's, I, I, if I had to guess, that's what I would say he was doing because notice what happens, verse 7. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, here's all he said. He said, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at him. He didn't say no or yes. He just said this. Well, if there's anybody here, if there's anybody here that's without sin, Cast the first stone. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Jim, your lie on your taxes, whatever. Verse 9. And they which heard it, notice, unsaved people, no Holy Spirit inside of them, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. And of course, he tells her to go and sin no more. And the idea is this, the idea is this, that God has revealed himself through creation outwardly and through conscience inwardly. Go back to Romans chapter 1, if you would. Romans chapter 1. So we're doing a systematic study of doctrine. And we're starting where all mankind has to start, and it's through the doctrine of revelation. And specifically, we're talking about not specific revelation, but general revelation. How does God generally reveal himself to mankind, and he does it through creation. He does it through conscience. And here's the application, because I like to end every sermon with some sort of an application, and here we go, Romans 1.20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things which, that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Notice, here's the application. So that they are without excuse. Amen. Amen. You know that there's no human being who will ever stand before God with a proper and true excuse? No one. And here's what, here's what I believe, and, and here's what I think. I, I Honestly, and, and this might sound odd, if you study Acts chapter 10, and I think you, you, you read that, we read that recently in our nine chapters of the day, you have Cornelius, who's an unsaved man in a different religion, and he's genuinely searching after God, and God orchestrates this thing where Peter goes to preach the gospel to him. I believe if people are honestly searching for the truth, that God will do his best to get us involved in the ministry of reconciliation to find them. But whether you and I do what we're supposed to do, and we'll talk about that here in a minute, the point is this, that the doctrine of general revelation teaches that all mankind is without excuse. Whether they know the gospel or not, they know God. Whether they understand the gospel or not, they know God. Because God reveals himself through creation and conscience. And because God reveals himself through creation and conscience, everyone is without excuse. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 if you would. We're, we're almost done. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to give you 
One more verse and, and a quick story, and, and we'll be done. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Because when you preach sermons like these, people will say, well, it's not fair. I mean, you mean to tell me that creation is enough to condemn someone? Creation is enough to judge someone? Creation is enough to bring the wrath of God so that they, no one will stand before God with an excuse and say, I didn't know because their conscience would have told them, because creation would have told them, hey, there's a God out there. You better figure this thing out. People say, it's not, it's not fair. I mean, what if, what if and they always want to talk about some guy in the Amazon jungle who never heard the gospel. What about that guy? God's not fair. God's not right. God should do more. Well, you know what the answer to that question is? It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Look at verse 5. Notice what the Bible says. Actually, look at verse 4. For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Now, we're, we're jumping into a discussion here where you've got the church at Corinth, and they're divided into these groups. Don't we love to do that? Just look at Facebook, you know? They're divided into these groups, and some people say, well, I'm a Paul, and other people say, well, I'm of Apollos, and they're all fighting about these things. And here's what he says. Look at verse 3. Look at verse uh, 4. For what, uh, I'm sorry, verse 3. For ye are, for ye are, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Notice verse 5. He says, who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? You, know, you want to get all upset about Paul and Apollos and Cephas? He says, who is Paul and who is Apollos? He says, let me tell you exactly who Paul and Apollos are. This is what Paul is saying. He says, who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers by whom ye believed? He said, you know, all that Paul and Apollos are are just ministers that brought you the gospel that you may, may believe. And then he says this, and I want you to notice this. Even as the Lord gave to every man. You know the Bible teaches? That God has orchestrated a plan so that every believer, every unbeliever, has a believer assigned to them, and it's their job to get that person the gospel. I mean, that, isn't that what it's saying? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed? And he says, there's nothing special about them, even as the Lord uh, gave to every man. The Lord gave to every man a Paul. The Lord gave to every man an Apollos. The Lord gave to every man someone that's supposed to bring the gospel to them. And here's what I think is funny. People will say, well, if someone doesn't hear the gospel, that means that God is not fair and God is not doing enough. You know who's not fair? The believers out there who aren't soul winning, they're not fair. Say, God's not doing enough. No, you're not doing enough. Because God, do you understand that God has given you a responsibility? There are certain people that you're supposed to bring the gospel to, and when you fail to do so, it's not God's fault. It's your fault. And it's my fault. Because God gave a minister to every man. So yeah, quit the garden and show up for soul winning. Quit the little league and show up for soul winning. Quit whatever distractions are distracting you and show up for soul winning because there are people out there whose conscience is telling them there is a God and they need you. To bring the gospel to them. Because on the day of judgment, on the day of judgment, they will be without excuse. When I was a teenager, many of you know, most of you know, I think, I was born in Venezuela. My family's from Venezuela. We moved to the U.S. when I was four years old. Yes, we are citizens. <laughs> and when I was a teenager, we had our cousins visiting from Venezuela. And uh, they came and visited. I was like 15 years old or something. And I had one of my older cousins. He was maybe 17 years old. He came to visit, and we went to we, we our church had teen soul winning. We went out to teen soul winning, and we were out knocking doors and uh, inviting people to church, preaching, you know, asking people about salvation or whatever. I remember this lady opened the door, and we began to try to give her the gospel. I, I was trying to give her the gospel, and she listened and she wanted to hear it. And and she said to me, she said, she said, I can't believe that. 
I can't believe that because that's just not fair. That's not right. That means that if somebody that never got this message, if, if salvation is just through Jesus Christ, because he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If, if, if you can only come to the Father through him, then what about people who don't know? And it was what she said to me. And I had my cousin who'd literally just gone here the day before from Venezuela. She said, what about people in Venezuela? who have never heard the gospel. And I said, well, actually, I was born in Venezuela, and he just got here from Venezuela, and we're here trying to give you the gospel. Right. <laughs> because the message of salvation has truly gone through all the world. And God has revealed himself to all mankind through creation and through conscience. But it is our job to take the specific revelation of God's word to the uttermost part of the earth. So you stay tuned. We learned about general revelation. Next week, we're going to learn about specific revelation. We talked tonight about how God reveals himself generally to mankind. Next week, we'll learn how God reveals himself specifically to mankind. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the Bible. And Lord, thank you for the fact that the truth is this, that you care about mankind. And you've really prime the pump for us to bring the gospel to a lost and dying world. People have to be convinced. They have to be manipulated. They have to be brainwashed. They have to be educated into not believing God. Because creation reveals that there is a God, and our conscience reveals that there is a God. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to have a firm understanding of this very basic doctrine of general revelation. In the matchless name of Christ, we pray. Amen.